Hello and welcome to Collab 365. I'm super excited to be here today talking about how you can enhance the usability of your SharePoint site with JS Link. Now typically when you think of SharePoint site usability, JS Link doesn't exactly come to mind. So let me explain how this session came about. Last spring, I did a session for the SP Biz Conference called Creating a GTD Dashboard to Get Things Done. And a lot of the changes that I made was made using JavaScript in JS Link. So I decided to just expand upon those things and also add several new things that you could do for this session. My name is Wendy Neal and I'm from the Cedar Rapids, Iowa area. And by trade, I would call myself a .NET and SharePoint developer. However, I'd also call myself an evangelist because I like to talk about and encourage the use of SharePoint to whoever will listen. And I evangelized SharePoint on my personal blog, as well as a few of the other industry and community websites out there. And if you'd like to get a hold of me, my contact details are over there on the right hand of the slide. And here's an agenda of what we'll be talking about today. We will go over a very brief usability overview. I talk about usability in a lot of my presentations, and some I do more of a deep dive than others. This will just be be very brief because I want to focus on, on JS Link and the JavaScript solutions that we will be seeing later. We will talk about what is JS Link, some best practices around it, how you would set that up. And then we'll also look at some pretty cool things that you can do with JS Link. And then at the end of the session, I'll have a demo and, and we'll go through and show you you know, a bunch of things that you can do and, and kind of how to set those up. And we'll actually look at a couple of uh, JavaScript files. Now, this is a very high level power user type audience session. So I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be a lesson in how to write JavaScript or anything like that, but we will open up a couple files and just to kind of take a look and, and see that they're, they're not really all that scary. Okay, brief usability overview. And I only have a couple slides on this again. The main thing I wanna point out is the number one rule of website usability, and that is don't make me think. So this also happens to be the name of a great book on usability by Steve Krug, and it's one that I really like. It's a really light read. It's not filled with boring usability theory or things like that. It really just contains a lot of common sense tips, and then once you read it, you'll say, oh my gosh, that's so obvious, but you just might not think about it every day. So basically, according to Krug, your website should be self-evident, obvious, self-explanatory, Users shouldn't have to think or your site shouldn't cause them confusion. It should just be obvious of what they're supposed to do. So what are some of the things that make website users frustrated? This isn't an exhaustive list here, but some of the more common things that can frustrate your users or at least make them stop and think. And just remember that the effects can be cumulative, meaning that one small thing that frustrates a user may not seem like such a big deal, but many small things will add up over time and add to the user's frustration level. Now, not all of these things that I have listed here apply to the solutions that I'm going to demo to you later, but the ones that are highlighted here, too many mouse clicks, the page is cluttered, too many words on the page, or it's not clear what you're supposed to focus on, the solutions that I'm gonna demo will help in some of in these areas. So what is JS Link? Well, in its simplest term, JS Link just means a way for you to link a JavaScript file to your page. And this is set in a web part property. So there's actually a property on the web part where you can set a link to your JavaScript file and then the page will execute that JavaScript upon loading. And so there's a lot of different objects that have a JS Link property available to them. List views, if you've got a list of items, the views that you can create that, that shows you all the items. Now there's some exceptions to that, the calendar view being one of them. You cannot add a JS link to a calendar view in order to alter the, the look and feel of that, which is unfortunate. Uh, we'll also talk about list forms. So with any list, you get your standard new edit and view forms where you can add, edit, or just view the data. List view and list form web parts. What that means is you could create a page, a wiki page, and then you can add web parts to the page that display your list 
views or your list forms, your new edit and view forms. You can also add JS link to those, those web parts. You can add JS link to site columns and content types as well. So um, an example where you might want to add it to a site column is if you want every column in every library or in every list of your site to have the same functionality. You could add the, the JS link to your site column and then wherever that site column gets dropped into a list, it will execute that. The three items here that are highlighted, list views, list forms, and the list view and edit form web parts, these are what we're going to focus on uh, throughout the rest of the session. There are different ways that you can set the JS link property on a web part. You can do it through a field definition. And this would be more for probably a developer if you're creating a custom field and you're going to deploy it, say, with Visual Studio. You would set the JS link property in the XML field definition that goes along with that as you deploy it. You could set it in custom code. You could set it using PowerShell. Since this is a session focused towards power users and non-developers, we're going to focus on the user interface and how you can set the JS link property right from your web browser. So here I've got a screenshot of a web part properties pane, and this is how you can set the JS link property in your user interface. You would expand the miscellaneous section of the web part properties that's usually collapsed by default. And then down at the bottom where you see the JS link property and it's kind of highlighted in red there, you will input the link to your JavaScript file and the link must begin with a URL token. So in this example, we've got the tilde and the site, and that just references the, the site, the URL of the site. And the next slide, I'll go over the different token options that you can use there. And another thing to note is that you can reference multiple JavaScript files in the same web part. You just want to separate the calls with the, the pipe character. All right, so these are all the URL tokens that you can use. The one we just saw in the previous slide was the site token, and that just makes a reference to the current SharePoint site. If you use the site collection, you're referencing the current SharePoint site collection. So you could store your JavaScript files um, in a library in a site a top level site collection, and then maybe you're on a subsite or even a two, two levels deep, you could refer to those JavaScript files in that top level site collection by using the site collection URL token. The next three URL tokens are referencing various locations in your layouts folder, and this is only available on premises. It's not available in Office 365. This is the actual virtual folder on your on the web server where typically developers can deploy their custom code. So we will not be looking into these at all today. In fact, the JavaScript files that I'm going to demo, they're all going to be stored on the same site that I'm going to point to. So we'll be using the site token for all of our examples. Just a couple best practices around JS link and in JavaScript in general. Uh, you should try to create the reusable site collection JavaScript file if possible. Now, I realize with this audience, you know, you might not have access to the top level site collection. You might just be a site owner of a particular subsite. In that case, it's perfectly okay to store your JavaScript files on the same site. You want to avoid polluting the JavaScript global namespace, and you want to call your functions explicitly. Uh, in other words, not using self-executing functions. And there's some really good resources at the end of the slide deck that will explain to you why these are best practices. So I would highly encourage that you check those out. All right, now we're going to jump in. We're going to take a look at some pretty cool things that you can do with client-side scripting and JS link. I've got some screenshots here and we'll zip through these because afterwards I will demo everything that you'll see here in the screenshots. It's more of a reference for later. So on this screen, I've got a tasks list and this is my view screen. So I, it's a list of my current tasks and I've got several things going on here, um, three of which you can probably notice right off. Uh, we are color coding the reminder date so if it's past due, we're color coding it red. 
Um, if it's green, that means it's uh, today's date. And then if it's, if it's black, it's sometime in the future. And so how this helps with usability is you can see at a glance any overdue items that you've got in your list or anything that you need to focus on today. And you don't have to uh, strain too hard to realize that. The same with the priority icon. So the field itself, we have the values of high, medium, and low, but we've translated those into images. So if it's a red exclamation point, that's high priority. If it's showing the blue down arrow, that means it's low priority. And if there's no icon, it's just normal priority. So again, that just helps you quickly just see what your high priority and low priority items are without having to think too much. One thing that you don't see here, or that might not be too obvious, is that the priority column header, that the priority is hidden. And that's just so it would it would shrink the column a little bit, because if you have the, the priority header there, it made it kind of wide and didn't look quite as nice. We've got a context field on the right-hand side of the screen. And basically, th this is a, a GTD concept. Basically, a context is the place or situation in which you would you would execute a task. So we've got a few here. We've got errands. We've got a phone call, online, email, office. Um, some other options might be home or different things. And that just helps you to filter the items you have and focus on. So in, in other words, if you're going to make some phone calls, you can filter out all the phone calls you need to make. Or if you're in the office, you can just filter out and just view the things you need to do while you're in the office or any emails that you need to send and that kind of thing. And so by color coding these, it just makes it easier to kind of see and quickly see what, you know, what you've got going on without having to filter the list or, or look too hard. The standard SharePoint list is basically black and white, and it's not really easy to, to see or make decisions without looking pretty deeply. The last thing that's going on here is there's, there's a hidden color column. So the way we're color coding these context fields is I'm looking at another field that has the, the color code in it, and then I'm hiding that entire column. So the column has to be present in your view in order to be able to utilize it, but then you can hide it if you don't want it to be ultimately seen. So here's my context list. It's basically just a list with my different contexts, so email in this case, and then the color. And what I've done, instead of having the user have to type in a hex code and figure out what that is, I've added a color picker to the field so that when they click on it, it will pop open this color picker and you can pick whichever color you want and save it. And so we'll, we'll take a look at that in the demo as well. It's, it's pretty cool and it's a pretty easy solution to implement. Okay, I've also got a projects list. This is my view page, and I've got two things going on here. I'm color coding rows based on status, and I'm also, I also have a percent complete slider. So what that means is that you can look at your list. At a glance, I can look and see. So I've got several different project statuses, and I can tell just by looking projects that are on schedule, anything that's at risk is in yellow, Anything that's overdue is red, and I can immediately look at that. And then as well as this, this percent complete slider, just gives me a more visual. I can see which ones are complete, which ones are half done, which ones are barely started. So again, as far as usability is concerned, people don't have to think so hard when they get to the page. They can see immediately um, any problem areas or things that need to be addressed. I've added a couple of things to my projects list edit form. So the one thing I've done is I've turned the title into a read-only control when it's in edit mode. And this would be if you don't want a field to be changed once it's been entered in, then you can turn, set it to be read-only. I've also added a percent complete input slider to the page. So this just lets me click and drag to choose the percent complete without having to type in a number. Now on my projects list add form, I've added the capability where we can auto-populate this category field based on a value that's passed in from the query string. So you can see in my top image up there, we're passing in category equals facilities in the query string. 
in my my JavaScript, my JS link is taking that value, and then it's populating this category value based on what was passed in. And where this would be helpful, so so these are projects, and say we have different project types. We have IT projects, facilities projects, operations. And you can have many many different types of projects. And where this would be useful is if say you're on for example, the IT homepage, and somebody wants to create an IT project. Well, you could have a link to this project add project page, and then you could pass in IT as the category, and it would automatically populate that. It's just the user doesn't have to then populate it once they get here. It's a really simple example, but it could be very powerful. And another thing you could also do would be to hide that column from the form so they don't even have to see it and it just automatically populates it in the back end. We have a suppliers list here and I've added some delete icons next to the edit icons and really you could do this to virtually any list that you wanted to uh, and when they click the X it will pop up and ask them are you sure you want to delete this and if they say okay it deletes the item and so this is basically going to greatly reduce the number of clicks that the user would have to do to delete the item. They would have to select it and go up into the ribbon or they have to click the, the little ellipsis icon and click two or three more times before they can delete it. So it's going to save time and frustration. It just lets them delete something right from the view. On my suppliers list add and edit forms, I've added an email field validator. So I've added some JavaScript code there that checks in if the email address isn't in the proper format it will not submit the form and it will tell you it's an invalid email and in this while, while it'll help the users and enter the right information it's not necessarily going to be a time saver for them but it could be a save instances where if you don't have an invalid email address and you're trying to send an email to this user from a workflow it's going to blow up it's not going to work and so you you want to make sure you have properly formatted email addresses in the field. Here I've got an announcements list and what I've done here is taken the body of the announcement and trimmed it down. So trimming down the long body text and then adding a more link as well. So when they click on more it's going to open that item in in a new window and so they can read the entire announcement. And basically where this helps with usability is you're not going to have so much text on the page where you're scrolling down forever to see all the items when you can just get a glimpse and then the ones you want to read more you can click through and and read more and lastly I've got a team sales list and I've applied the JS link so that it will color code any negative numbers so again while it's not much it just gives the user a visual of immediately, like I can immediately see which teams have done worse this quarter than they did previous quarter within a millisecond and I, without having to look at the data too hard. All right, now we will jump into a demo. All right, the first thing I wanna show you is I wanna go into our site assets library. This is where I have all of my JavaScript files stored as well as some images. I have a CSS file that one of them's referring to um, and some more icons. So this is where we store all of our JavaScript. And so let me go back to this task list and let's review what's going on here. So we have our reminder date is color coded based on uh, whether it's overdue today or future. We have our priority icons here showing up. Um, exclamation point if it's high priority, down arrow if it's low, nothing if it's just normal priority. And remember I said we're hiding the name of the column. Well, we, we are hiding it because you don't see it up here, but we still have our drop down menu showing here where we can sort or, or filter by priority. So that's still there. The other thing we're doing here is we're color coding the context column and we're also hiding the color field that is actually used to render the proper color and which we'll see we'll see later. And let's take a look at how the JS link property is set before we look at the rest of the use cases here. If we click on our gears icon and click edit page 
and then we can get into our web part edit mode by clicking on the drop down arrow and, sit, and clicking on edit web part. Remember we go down to the bottom and we expand the miscellaneous section and here's our JS link property right here and I am going to highlight all of this copy it into a new page so we can see this because remember I mentioned that you can put multiple references to JS link let me turn word wrap on so we can see it you can put multiple references to different JavaScript files separated by the pipe character so here we've got this priority icon you can see we're using the site token and then we're appending site assets, which is the name of the library that it's saved in, and then the name of the file. So we have our priority icon file. We're color coding the context, color coding the date. And one thing to point out is I have another one here, another reference here that's pointing to the layouts folder, and it's called hierarchy task list.js. If I go back to the site, so these checkboxes here are actually JavaScript functionality that's included default in the standard out of the box task list view. If you add your own JS link to the web part, this disappears. And after I did some research, I found out that you have to explicitly include it back in if you want that to remain there. So only if you add something to the JS link property then you must include that if you want to keep that functionality there. So that's really handy to know. Okay, now what I wanted to do, we'll go back into edit mode, is show you how this looks totally different. If I re completely remove, I'm going to copy it because I want to add it back, but we'll delete it. And so you can see here, that here, now I'm seeing my, my priority column. My, my dates are no longer color coded. I don't have the icons here. My contexts aren't color coded. And then I'm showing this, this color column. And again, if, if I want to use the value of a column, it has to be included in the view or else I can't get a handle on it. But then I want to, then you can go and hide it because I don't want that to actually show. I just want to use this value to render the color of the context. So you can see how looking at this view, if I go back and add that back in, and you can tell me which view is more pleasant to look at as well as can give you some good information. you know, looking at it quickly without having to think too much. And there we go. All right, let's take a look at that context list. And basically my context list is a lookup list that's used to populate the drop down of the context when, when a person is, is adding or editing a task. So let's take a look at that. So here we go, we've got our list, we've got all of our choices along with all of the colors. And so whether I add a new item or edit, we'll just go in to edit this, this value. So I've added JS link to the page where if I click this now, I get, I get my color picker expanding here and I can literally click anywhere on the screen and find the color I want and I can, I can save that. And you'll notice it saved the new value here. So this is very handy for users who don't know or don't know how to figure out what the hex value is for a certain color. If they just want to choose a color that they like, they can use that color picker. At the end of the demo here, we'll actually look at a couple of these JavaScript files so you can see what they're doing. Uh, let's go, let's uh, look at some of these other things. So our projects list, we've got color coded color coding the entire row based on the project status and then we also have these percent complete sliders so you can see at a glance which project is overdue um, which ones you know are close to being complete or not very far along so again just some visual cues that can help you quickly see the important data that you need to see now on this screen you notice the the percent complete slider is, is static I can't do anything with it 
But let's say I want to go in and edit one of these, go into Edit View, then I can just click and drag to whatever I want that to be and save it. And now you can see now it's 50% complete. Another thing I wanted to show you on this projects list is if we add a new item, by default this category field is not populated. And I'm just going to remove everything after the in the query string and I'm just going to say category equals operations click enter it should auto populate the category to operations and again that would be really handy if you have a hyperlink to this page from various locations on your internet it can auto populate that based on where it's coming from the other thing I forgot to show you while we were in edit mode is that this title is now read only. So once, you know, we've the business has decided that once a project gets named, we can't change the name going forward. And so by making this read only on the edit page, we can't edit that. All right, let's look at our suppliers list. Here we've added a delete icon next to the edit icon on every row. So if I click on that, are you sure you want to permanently delete the item? OK. And the page refreshes and it's gone. Also, if I add a new item here, and I'll put my name in there, and I'll uh, just type an email address that's not formatted properly, it's going to tell me invalid email address. All right, let's take a look at this announcements list. So here is where we've trimmed the body. If I actually go in and, and view this, you'll see that there's, there's quite a bit of text here, okay? And what I've done is, is trimmed it down. I think it's showing like the first 50, 50 characters. You can set that to whatever number you want. And then I've added a more link so that when you click that, again, it will open up the announcement. And you could even, set it to open it up in a modal dialog pop-up if you wanted to. Um, but I just have it opening up to the page. All right, the last thing here, team sales. You can immediately see which teams are doing more poorly than they did last month by color coding negative numbers. And again, just to review, if we go into the edit page here, edit web part, open up miscellaneous, and you can see we've got a reference to our, our site, our root site URL, URL, site assets library, and then, and then color negative number.js. That's the name of the JavaScript file that we want to reference here and execute. Okay, so let's actually look at some of the JavaScript files. Let's look at this read-only one. It's, it's probably one of the shorter ones, and it's really easy to follow, I think. Basically, what we're doing is we're creating our own namespace. I'm calling it Collab365, and then I've got some functions here and I'm calling it Collab365, that's my namespace, and then the name of my function is this render read-only field. Okay, so since this is a function, it's not going to execute unless something calls it. Okay, this is not a self-executing function. But we're basically creating a variable, we're setting our template and our fields. Basically what, what this line does is says that tell me which fields that you want to manipulate somehow using the JavaScript. And so in this case, I'm going to manipulate the title field. Remember, this is where I'm setting a field to read only. So I wanted to set my title field to be read only. So I need to specify the name of the actual field that I want to work with. And then these sections here, so we've got, we've got our display form, we have our edit form, our new form and our view. You can run, you can call a JavaScript function on any of those, all of them, some of them, one of them, 
um, you can call different functions for different things. So one example was on my projects page, I had my slider, percent complete slider was kind of in a read only state on the, on the view. So I would have called a different function here on the view, but on my add and edit form, which would have been edit form and new form, um, I was I had a slider that you could click and drag, and so we could have, we could call two different functions there. For this case, I'm only adding this read only functionality if they're in edit mode, because if they're adding a new value, a new item, we want to make sure they can fill that form in. And then on the display form and the view, it doesn't matter because it's just the whole form is read only anyway. Okay, so what this is saying is that when I'm on the edit form, I want to call this function and execute it. And then this line basically here is, is passing in this, our variable and actually what's running it. So here's my set read only function that I'm calling when the edit form loads. And basically all I'm doing, this one's a real simple one. It's just got one line of text. I'm returning my SP field form display default and basically that's what's telling the form to be read only. It's, it's returning the default value if this was the display form. And then here, my, the last line of code here, this is what's actually calling this function, okay? This is calling this render read only field function which is, which is executing and then in turn executing the set read only function to set that title field as read only. So again, I don't wanna go too deep into the JavaScript coding lesson because I, I don't think that's the audience I have here, but just in case you wanted to know how that works. And again, I've got a bunch of references uh, at the end of the slide deck that will go in and goes into very much detail about the, the specifics of these JavaScript files and how they work. And so if you wanna learn more, highly recommend you go and check that out. Let's take a look at a couple more of the JavaScript files. This one is the populate category JavaScript. So this was on the projects page again. If you pass a parameter through the query string, it would take that, read that value, and then uh, set the default value of the category field. So you can see, and the format of all these files is very similar. This one's got a couple extra things going on here, so I'll point those out. But this time we're talking about the category field. So we change that here, we, so we specify that here. And then in this case, we only want to run our code on the new form, and we're gonna run this set category function. We come down here to the set category function. Basically, the first thing we'll do is we're going to set a category variable, and we're going to get the parameter from the query string called category. And so I have another function down here. You can call other functions from within your function. And so this get parameter by name. This was just a JavaScript function I grabbed from the web that will read a value from the query string. So basically we're grabbing the value from the query string. So whatever was passed, whether it's IT or facilities or whatever, then we're going to check and make sure that that category isn't blank because if it is blank, it could blow up the code. So if it's not blank, we're going to set our current field value to that category value. And then we're going to return the SP field choice edit, which is our default template for rendering a choice field control. And so different field types have different default templates for rendering them. So keep that in mind. This is for a choice field. And then we're just going to pass in our, our variable here, which already has our, our value set. Basically, that's going to populate the radio button with the value that was entered through the query string. And then again, the, we're, we're rendering that category field, calling this function up here. Let's look at the priority icon, because there's something even just a little bit different in this one. So up until this point, Everything here looks very similar. We're, we're using, we're looking at the priority field and we're gonna call this display priority icon function on the view page only. So that's the only page where we're gonna change that I, the text into an icon. But there's an extra line here that you didn't see on those first two examples that I gave you. There's a non-pre-render 
a property that you can set. And basically what that means is it says run this function before the form is rendered. So pre-render before the form is rendered. So let's jump down and look at that one. That one's at the very bottom. So our modify header data, this is basically where we're saying where we're hiding the priority column header, just just the column header, not the column itself. So we're basically getting a hold of the priority field and then we're setting its display name to, in this case, blank. So we're not showing anything. But this is also the same method that you could use to change the display name to something else, whatever you want. You could, you could name it. If you wanted to abbreviate it or something, you could do that as well. But as far as the functionality that it's going to run when it encounters the priority field is this display priority icon function, which is right here. Here we're going to get a handle on the priority value and then we're just doing some simple if statements. If it contain basically the index of really means contains. If it contains high, then we're going to render, we're going to set our HTML as this image, so the priority high icon. Um, if it's normal, we're just going to set it blank because we're not going to show anything. And then if it's low, we're going to set it to the priority low icon dot PNG image. And then we're going to return that to the calling function and it's going to render that instead of the words high, low, normal. Okay, and the last one we'll look at here. This is our color coding our context and this is also very similar. Um, we're, we're looking at the context field and we're setting it, well we could also show this on the display form even though I don't have it set up that way, um, and the view form. This is where we're going to color code the context field to make it um, stand out a little bit. The thing that's different here is we have an on post render event. So if you remember, this is the one where we are hiding that entire color column. So not just the header, but the entire column, the headers and the values. So we have to wait until the form is completely rendered. So we are going to call this on post render object here. And so after this is saying after the form is completely rendered, call this function, so this hide color field. And that's down here at the bottom. This code is basically going through. It's using jQuery. It's locating the column, the color column, and then it's, it's hiding. It's hiding the, the table data and the table header. It's hiding the HTML. Okay. Now when we are going to view, when we're on our view form, when we get to the context field, we're going to run this color code context. And this is what we're doing. Basically, we're going through, we're getting a hold of the, the color field. So we're grabbing our, our context color. If it's undefined or doesn't exist, then we're just going to show nothing. Otherwise, we're going to set our HTML and we are, I'm adding, I've got some CSS that's also loaded into our, that's loaded into our site assets library. So it's looking at that CSS and it's using class label. This is what gives it the rounded corners and that changes the text color. But then also we have to explicitly set the background color and then we're passing in the color. So we're getting the color from that color field in our list. And then so we're setting the color to the background color and then we're passing in the context. We're, we're displaying that value. We're wrapping them all in a div. So we're building that HTML string and then we're returning that HTML string. So that is basically how you, how it's rendering you know, the rounded edges, the white text, the bold. Okay, there's a whole bunch more JavaScript files in there. Unfortunately, we don't have time to take a look at every one of them, 
but the good news is that I will have these available on my website right after the session is over and you can download those and use them in your own sites. Again, here's all the references that I was mentioning throughout the presentation. There's a lot of just super awesome stuff here. I encourage you to check this out if you want to learn more about the specifics of JavaScript and how to create your files and even just how the whole JS thing works in general. These are some great, great, great references here. And that wraps up this session for the Collab 365 conference. I know there were a lot of great sessions being presented in this time slot, and I really appreciate you selecting this one and, and tuning in. Again, I'm Wendy Neal, and thanks for watching.